A Lamp from the Warlock's Tomb by John Belair's Chapter 1. Hey, Miss Eels, watch out! Oh, calm down, Anthony. I may be clumsy, but I'm not all that clumsy. Why don't you go out to the car and read a road map till I'm through browsing in here? I hate to complain, but you are making me very nervous. On a sunny afternoon in the mid-1950s, Mrs. Myra Eels and her young friend, Anthony Monday, were poking around in an antique shop in the tiny Wisconsin town of Dresbach. Miss Eels was an odd, bird-like little woman with a messy nest of white hair and gold-rimmed spectacles. Anthony was tall and awkward-looking with a thin, pinched face and a long, pointed nose. He wore a red leather cap with a scrunched peak all the time, indoors and out, in rainy weather and bright sunshine. Right now, Anthony was looking worried, as he always did when he and Miss Eels were in antique shops. Miss Eels was the sort of person who could knock valuable china dishes off a table with a sweep of her arm or shatter Chinese urns by stumbling up against them. Anthony was always afraid she would break something that was fantastically expensive and then have to spend the rest of her life paying for it. At present, Miss Eels was standing in a narrow space between two big old dining room tables that were loaded with fragile-looking things, china cups and saucers, glass vases, medicine bottles, and oil lamps. She was moving her hands over the objects on the table as if she were a magician getting ready to do some enchantment. Suddenly, she swooped down and grabbed an oil lamp. It was really quite beautiful. The base was made of ruby-red glass, and the slender curved chimney was fitted with a pink outer globe that had cabbage roses printed on it. Miss Eels was crazy about oil lamps. She had several in her home, and she was always saying that some year she would turn off the electricity and live the way they did in the horse and buggy days, just for fun. Anthony was getting more nervous by the minute. He watched Miss Eels swing the fragile-looking lamp, making the outer globe rattle and squeak. For gosh sakes, Miss Eels, he burst out. Be careful, you might... But Miss Eels had had enough of Anthony's nittiness. Anthony Monday, you stop all this right now, she exclaimed indignantly. Good Lord, you'd think I was ten years old and you were my mother. It's true that I stick my foot into waste baskets now and then, but I have some really valuable and fragile objects in my home, and somehow I've managed to at this point. Miss Eels took a step backward, and as she did this, she jammed her right elbow against the tall bureau that was standing nearby. Her arm went numb, and the fingers of her right hand flew apart. For an agonizing second, she juggled the lamp, but then it fell to the floor with a loud crash. Horrified, Miss Eels and Anthony stared down at the wreckage. The owner had been up on the second floor, and now the sound of her footsteps echoed down on the hall stairs as she returned. Anthony and Miss Eels braced themselves for a scene. What on earth would Adele Grimshaw say? Would she yell at them and demand payment? Miss Eels reached down with her right hand and felt for the checkbook in her purse, which lay on the table. She had a feeling she, that she would need it. The hall door opened, and the owner, a frowning middle-aged woman with dyed brown stringy hair, stepped in. Mrs. Grimshaw always talked in a flat, in a flat, monotonous voice, and she acted as if she had never gotten any fun out of life. Now, as Miss Grimshaw, now as Miss Grimshaw stood staring down at the shattered oil lamp, Anthony braced himself for an explosion, but none came. Amazingly, Mrs. Grimshaw was quite calm. And once or twice, Anthony thought she was actually going to smile, but each time the smile started, she coughed and wiped her hand with her mouth. I'm really awfully sorry, said Miss Eels in a distressed voice. I was just bragging to my friend here about how careful I was being, being, but I guess the gods of clumsiness were listening and decided to punish me. I can pay for... Oh, that won't be necessary, said Mrs. Grimshaw with a careless wave of her hand. To tell the truth, I have never liked that lamp, Myra. Why don't I go get a why don't I get a broom and dustpan and you and I can go upstairs and find a lamp that you might want to buy? How does that sound? Miss Eels was astounded. She knew Mrs. Grimshaw pretty well, and she had always thought that the woman was an incredible fuss budget. But here she was, shrugging her shoulders when a valuable oil lamp got smashed to smithereens. It was all pretty strange. The alarm bells began to ring in Miss Eels' mind. There's something wrong here, she said to herself, but she managed to smile politely and thanked the woman for being so understanding. Anthony heaved a deep sigh of relief. A few minutes later, Miss Eels, Mrs. Grimshaw, and Anthony were up in one of the rooms on the second floor. Chattering nervously, the owner led her two customers past some stacked boxes to an old marble-topped bureau. A carved wooden screen rose from the top of the bureau, and it held a wooden box that looked like a medicine chest. Miss Eels and Anthony watched Miss 
As Miss Eels and Anthony watched, Mrs. Grimshaw opened the door to the front of the chest and took out a small oil lamp. As soon as Miss Eels saw the lamp, she fell in love with it. The chimney was a slender, curved vase of ground of brown glass, and on the base were little Dutch scenes painted in blue on milky white china, windmills, a low fence near a grassy dune, a canal boat with a fisherman sitting on the bow. Anthony and Miss Eels saw all these as Miss, Grim saw, as Miss Grimshaw slowly turned the lamp around. It's wonderful, thought Miss Eels, but then another thought occurred to her. Why had the owner of the antique shop kept this beautiful oil lamp up here, shut inside a dark cabinet? Do you like it? asked Mrs. Grimshaw as she turned the lamp back and forth in her hands. In spite of the doubts and fears that kept flitting through his mind, Miss Eels had kept flitting through her mind. Miss Eels had to admit she was fascinated by the lamp. She imagined it sitting on one of the oval antique sitting on the oval antique table next to her living room sofa, but Miss Eels knew that Miss Grimshaw would jack up would jack the price up if she acted too enthusiastic. Why, yes, it's quite nice murmured Miss Eels as calmly as she could. How much do you want for it? The owner told her the price. Miss Eels' mouth dropped open. It was unbelievably cheap. Why? Why was the woman selling this lovely antique lamp for such a low price? Miss Eels turned to Anthony. What do you think, Tony? Anthony frowned and shrugged. It's okay, I guess. I don't know anything about antiques, so I guess I'm a bad person to ask. Miss Eels hesitated. She really loved the lamp, but something inside was telling her to watch out. Finally, she heaved a deep sigh, grinned, and unsnapped the top of her purse. I'll take it, she said excitedly. I shouldn't spend the money, but I really can't resist. It's one of the prettiest antique oil lamps I've ever seen. Yes, isn't it, said Miss Grimshaw in an odd voice. Come downstairs, and I'll wrap it up for you. So Anthony and Miss Eels followed Mrs. Grimshaw downstairs to the counter at the front of the shop. Miss Eels wrote out a check. The owner packed the lamp into a cardboard box and stuffed wads of newspaper to keep the lamp from rattling around on the trip home. Then Miss Eels said goodbye, and she and Anthony went out to her car and drove off. The road back to Hoosack ran along the eastern bank of the Mississippi River, and on the left, tall limestone bluffs loomed. As they drove along, Miss Eels and Anthony were strangely silent. The box with the lamp in it lay on the seat between them, and every now and then Miss Eels glanced nervously at it. Then she would force herself to forget about the box and go back to staring at the road. The sun went down and the twilight deepened in, into night. Headlights came on and still they drove. Neither of them said a word. What are you thinking about, Anthony? Miss, asked Miss Eels suddenly. The sound of her own voice startled her. It seemed high-pitched and squeaky. I'm thinking about that dumb, uh, the dumb lamp you bought, said Anthony sullenly. How come Mrs. Hooses hid it away inside a chest? If she liked it, wouldn't she want to show it off? You would think so, said Miss Eels thoughtfully. On the other hand, maybe she liked the lamp so much that she hid it and hoped that no one would buy it. But then why did she rush up and dig it out for us? When I broke the other lamp, the whole incident is really weird when you come to think of it. Yeah, muttered Anthony as he scratched his ear. Maybe Mrs. Hooses is... My gosh, look out! Straight ahead, a man was standing in the middle of the road. With a yell, Miss Eels swerved the car sharply to the right. When she jammed on the brakes, the car skidded sideways over crackling gravel and came to a stop near a row of wooden posts. Heavenly days, gasped Miss Eels. What on earth do you suppose the fool was doing out that fool was doing out there in the middle of the road? Anthony scowled. I don't know, he said, but I'm gonna go out and give him a piece of my mind. Before Miss Eels could do anything to stop him, Anthony was out of the car and walking boldly along the gravelly shoulder of the road. He stopped just beyond the glare of the headlights and cupped his hands to his mouth. Hey, you, he yelled. What the heck are you doing? You might have got us all killed. Silence. Anthony peered into the darkness, and he found that he could just barely make out a short man who seemed to be wearing a long black overcoat. The man started walking toward the side of the road, and Anthony followed him. A full moon had just risen over the tall, shadowy bluffs, and by its light, Anthony saw the man disappear into a little clump of trees. Anthony hesitated. He knew it was dangerous to follow the man, but he was angry. With long strides, Anthony moved toward the trees, but suddenly he stopped. A chill seized his body, and he trembled violently. He felt a sickening, numbing fear. For about a minute, Anthony just stood there, shaking with his eyes closed. Then the chill passed, and he forced his eyes to open. After a quick, fearful glance at the dark mass of boughs, Anthony turned and ran back to the car. Good Lord! 
exclaimed Miss Eels as he jerked the car door open. Anthony, that was an unbelievably foolish thing to do. That man might have had a knife or a gun, and you could have gotten yourself killed. Anthony slumped into his seat and folded his arms. He was struggling hard to hide his fear. Aw, oh, he was just a creepy little guy in an overcoat. He muttered disdainfully. Miss Eels gave Anthony an exasperated glance, and with an anxious sigh, she turned to the ignition key and revved up the engine. Maybe you could have handled that man, she said quietly. But on the other hand, maybe you couldn't have. Is your door locked? Good. Hang on, because we are going to burn some rubber. And with that, Miss Eels threw the car into gear and roared off in a cloud of smoke. As they drove back to Hoosack, Mrs. Miss Eels and Anthony did not say much. When Anthony finally got out of the car in front of his house, he felt depressed and fearful. He was worried about Miss Eels. This made no sense because he was the one who had been in danger a few minutes ago, not her. Nevertheless, he was afraid that something would happen to her. Silently, Anthony told himself that he was being silly. Miss Eels was always in danger because she was a clumsy person. Yet somehow, she had made it almost to the age of 70. Probably she would survive for another day or two. At least Anthony forced himself to smile and wave goodbye cheerfully. But as Miss Eels drove off, he felt a stab of fear again. Why was he worried? Weeks passed, and life went on as usual for Anthony. During the day, he went to classes at Hoosack High School, and in the evenings, he worked in the public library. Miss Eels was the head librarian there, and she had hired Anthony a few years ago because she liked him and wanted to do something that would make Anthony feel better about himself. Since then, Anthony and Miss Eels had gotten to be close friends. They played chess, and Anthony told her things he would never have told his mother. And when things were slow at the library, the two of them would just sit around and gossip and enjoy each other's company. It was an odd friendship, but it worked. One gray November afternoon, Anthony walked into the Hoosack Public Library and immediately started looking for Miss Eels. She wasn't hard to find. She was on her knees in front of the fireplace in the East Reading Room, trying unsuccessfully to build a fire. Heaps of burnt matches littered the hearthstone, and the mouth of the fireplace was stuffed with wads of scorched newspaper. As Anthony watched, Miss Eels tried to strike a match on the sandpapered side of the box that she held in her hands, but the match broke in two, and the flaring tip landed on the hem of her dress, swearing angrily. She beat the flame out with her hands and then turned to glare up at Anthony. Her face was red and she was breathing heavily. Well, she said. Anthony didn't know what to say. Usually Miss Eels was pretty outgo was pretty easygoing, and he enjoyed talking to her, but today he had a favor to ask of her, and he began to think maybe this was not the time to ask for favors. Suddenly Miss Eels laughed. The hard lines of her face relaxed, and she shook her head slowly. I'm sorry I snapped at you, Tony, she said, still chuckling, but I'm in one of my firebug moods. Maybe someday I will chop the library furniture into kindling wood and burn the place down, and that will convince people I'm not to be trusted with matches. She sighed. I think you look like someone who wants to ask me a favor, am I right? Anthony was amazed. Miss Eels was the sort of person who couldn't open a can of beans without cutting her hand to ribbons. But she always knew what was on his mind. Slowly, with a lot of hemming and hawing, Anthony explained. His physics class was doing a project for the science fair that was going to be held in a week. He and some friends were planning an exhibit that demonstrated old-fashioned methods of lighting. One boy was making a replica of a Roman clay lamp, and a girl was making a colonial rush lamp. Anthony said that he would get hold of a kerosene lamp for the project. At first, he had planned to bring one from his own home, but his mother was worried that the lamp would get broken, so she had refused to let him have it. Now he was turning to Miss Eels from help, for help. And we won't hurt it, I promise, said Anthony. We'll only need it for a little while, and I'll be the only one who's allowed to... Oh, for heaven's sake, Anthony, stop begging, said Miss, e Miss Eels in an exaggerated voice. You can have the lamp. I'll be delighted to let you take it. Then she smiled strangely and added in an odd voice. To tell you the truth, I've never taken it out of its box. When was it I bought the lamp? A month ago, I think. Well, ever since then, it's been lying in a corner of my living room like a mummy in a coffin. I guess I didn't like it as much as I thought I did. In any case, it's yours to use. And if you should accidentally drop it out a third-story window, well, I think I'd probably forgive you. Anthony stared blankly at Miss Eels. Something very odd was going on, that was for certain. He remembered how Miss Eels had oohed and awed over the lamp in Mrs. Grimshaw's antique shop. What had made her change her mind? 
Anthony worked at the library till closing time, as usual, and Miss Eels offered to give him a ride home. On the way, they were going to stop by her house so that he could pick up the lamp. As they rode along, Anthony told Miss Eels that he thought she looked tired. Funny you should mention it, Miss Eels, said Miss Eels, smiling wryly. Tony, I haven't been getting a lot of sleep lately. I keep waking up and imagining that I hear things. Once, I thought I had left the radio on downstairs, but when I went down to check, they were all turned off, and another time, I thought someone was rattling the front door, but I guess it was just the wind. It might have been burglars, said Anthony nervously. My mom says that break-ins are on the increase everywhere, and oh, your mother, said Miss Eels, laughing. <laughs> she must sit up nights worrying about all the ghastly things that could happen to people she knows. No, my friend, it's not burglars. It's too many cups of coffee late at night. I'm having Sanka this evening, and then I'm going to hit the sack with a loud thud and sleep till my alarm goes off at eight o'clock. When they got to Miss Eel's house, she went inside and brought out the white china lamp. It was still nearly packed in its box, and the top of the box was sealed with, a, with masking tape. With the box on his lap, Anthony rode back to his house with Miss Eels. Keep it as long as you like, said Miss Eels with a careless shrug. I suspect that I spent all that money for nothing. I mean, it's really a rather ugly lamp, isn't it? Well, see you tomorrow. And with that, she rolled up the car window and drove off. Once again, a dark, shapeless worry began to form in Anthony's mind. He looked down at the box in his hands and frowned. Then he sighed and told himself that there was nothing to worry about. Nothing in all the world. And that is the end of chapter one.